I've got a practice with Robert Pruitt. We were both students in Bath in uh, the 80s and 90s, and um, we set up in London. I moved to Somerset about five years ago, so we've got two offices. Um, the title, House to House, I, I started off, my first project was building my own house in London, which was this one. And when I moved to Somerset, uh, we sold that and built a new house in Somerset. And so th the lecture's a rough trajectory between those two, but it's uh, by no means a straight line. And um, I think architecture is always billed as you're supposed to have this very clear concept, and everything's supposed to be very logical and rational. And, but actually, it's a torturous process, and you kind of find your way somehow. So this, that's kind of this story. Um, I'm definitely going to talk about passive house, low energy buildings, because that's a lot of our work now. But it, it wasn't really to start with. And I think fundamentally, low energy eco architecture, whatever, should not be a separate category. There's just architecture. And, and really, all architecture should be low energy. Most houses should be passive house if possible. Um, I don't see it as any sort of separate thing. So we're very much architects who have chosen to investigate how we can build with a minimal impact on the environment and to reduce the carbon footprint of our buildings and, and their associated energy use. So when our main preoccupations are architectural, really, um, buildings are about people, fundamentally. So we think about our design very much in the way that people use buildings and how they interact with them and how they feel them. Um, it's also about a spatial response, the physicality of building, the form. Um, it's very much about how buildings are made. I mean, crucially, with low energy um, design, detailing is critical. Um, but that has to work totally in conjunction with the architectural concepts. It's not a kind of add-on thing or a, oh, it's an eco-building, so it has to look like this. We, we totally come at it as an integrated subject. And finally, atmosphere and emotional response. In the end, the point of architecture is what people feel, that people enjoy being in places, that people respond well, that they work, hard, they work well in a place, they are happy there. So that's the kind of themes of, of how we think about our practice. This is where it started for me. I mean, I was working in a big practice, and I was obsessed with building my own house. And in London, I couldn't afford a flat, couldn't, couldn't afford anything, really. You'd, you'd save up a bit of money, and the prices of everything had gone up by more than that amount in the meantime, and you were constantly chasing this thing. And, but actually, around, this was 1999, um, little sites like this, a little leftover portion. There's a big Victorian terrace here, some 1980s social housing on the end, and to the right out of the scene is a big eight-story tower block. And this funny little site was just left over. And these things were unvalued. They didn't have any value. But then planning policy changed in 99. The government started, they brought in a PPG3, it was at the time, encouraging infill of brownfield, site, brownfield sites. So suddenly these things were buildable, buildable, buildable on, <laughs> which they hadn't been before. Um, anyway, I managed to buy this for not much money and set about trying to design a house on it. And my first kind of model, my first ideas were a very kind of typical architecty thing, just kind of concrete base with a kind of core 10 box plonked on top and all those kind of, well, ideas I'd had as a student. And your, your first projects, they take, they, they take a lot of pressure. It's almost like, a, I guess, a first novel must be similar. You just throw everything, every idea you've ever had at it, and this poor little building's kind of quaking under all this kind of weight of ideas. And, but I kind of stepped back a bit from that, and I got planning permission for this in no time. No one objected. And, but I just didn't feel very comfortable with it. Um, and it's a really awkward site. It's got the neighbouring building's got two windows directly overlooking it. The window behind the building behind's got windows. It's on a corner. It's on a busy street. I became much more interested in it as a kind of three-dimensional puzzle, as a kind of um, spatial exercise in trying to get the most possible out of this site. So had this big roof light at the back, a little pop-up and a roof terrace on the top, and the design kind of evolved much more as a kind of sculptural thing, kind of taking stuff away from a, a, a volume based on rights of light and um, views and things, rather than this box on a plinth idea. And rather than the kind of concrete and core 10, which, which could have been great, I became really interested in brick. I mean, London's a brick city, and particularly these sort of 1950s and 60s, council blocks. There's plenty of seats over this side if you want to come over. These, these council blocks, which were built in a very basic way after the war, and I guess very low budget, but there was a lot of thought in them. 
um, massive brick walls, just the kind of scale and monumentality to them, but then also this human scale of these little kind of picture frame windows. Um, a little row of shops in Southwark, it's, I think it's demolished now and replaced with some flats, but um, a similar idea, but this just little window beautifully kind of framing the kind of vitrine of the stuff going on inside, just in a really plain London stock brick wall. Um, I was looking for somewhere to work as well. I wanted to set up a practice. I needed an office from home, and these sort of buildings were interesting. A, a kind of weaver's loft, I think this is in Yorkshire, um, little cottage on the ground floor, and at the top where the structure can be lighter, there's just lots of windows where um, cloth workers would have worked. So I developed this three-storey um, section, putting the stair in the corner and having a big sort of open-plan living kitchen dining space on the lower floor, bedroom and bathroom above, and then a, the studio at the top with a big window. And it's just, and budget was a thing as well, I'd had very little money, so the cheapest way to build actually is a brick cavity wall. I looked at prefabricated timber and oh, prefabrication must be cheaper, all these things, but it's an awkward site, it's a one-off brick cavity wall was the cheapest thing to do. Um, so it's actually very conventional construction with timber joist floors. Um, but I became quite obsessed with the windows. Um, you see each of the windows is quite different because they're right on the street and the buses go past outside there. So the, the bathroom window's got a high window and it's quite small. The bedroom window's low so you can see out from sitting in bed. But the office window is much bigger where you don't have such a privacy issue and you can spend the day and see what's going on. Um, I'm going to talk about windows as a kind of theme going through this because it's, it's something we've developed almost through every project through to the passive house level stuff. So these are two, this is on Newington Green just around the corner from where my house was. It's a from eight, uh, 1680s house. I think it was from just before, it must have been 1660s, just before the Great Fire of London where the, the windows flush with the brickwork. But after the Great Fire, the first building regulations came in and one of them said that you couldn't have any timber within four inches, 100 mil, of the front of the, of the wall. So Georgian architecture, all the windows are set back by half a brick. Um, so that was quite a change in the way buildings looked. Um, and that coincided with people going on a grand tour, going to Italy, looking at people like Palladio, and these kind of very modelled elevations of strong, simple openings. And so the Georgian style really came out of this combination of um, a building regulation and a fashion. Um, so those windows look superficially quite similar, but actually there's quite a leap there and the sort of fineness of things. Um, and the other thing in that one to notice is the shutter boxes on the inside. It's a quite a deep window. There's quite a lot of control possible there through shade, um, solar shading. Um, so in this house, I was quite... In, this solid brick wall, it was, I was interested in emphasising the mass of the brickwork. It was effectively just a big brick wall through which you punch these cookie cutter type windows. So the frame of the window is quite chunky Douglas fir. And then on the inside, there's just a thin birch ply lining. So it's literally like a kind of thing that feels like it's been pushed through. And the glass is generally flush with the bricks on the outside. Except on the top floor where there's a bay window which projects. <coughs> Oops. So the bay window at the top um, looks down to Newington Green and you get this long view that way. Um, but in the other direction you get this equally very London view of just a little row of terrace houses and all their higgledy-piggledy windows. Um, another mantra in our office is that design is as much about seeing what's there already as it is about creating something new. Um, just by framing a view, just by appreciating something that's there, you can kind of really add to the richness without spending any money necessarily or... Uh, doing something clever yourself. And I also think, especially with, a, well, with any building, you have a kind of responsibility to the public realm. Um, this building was very directly on the street. Loads of people passed by on bus routes and bikes and things. And I really felt it should offer something to the street. And it does that in a few ways. But this window, I like how you kind of see some of the structure inside. You, you see, I mean, you can see me working. I used to wave at people and stuff. but. Um, equally, you can see the structure. It tells you a little bit about how the building's made. It's not just a kind of window. There's, the person who actually who's bought this house has put loads of blinds up, which I find really annoying. I kind of want to go in there and pull them all down, but uh, that was important to me. Um, 
monumentality is, is something I'm fascinated with. This is work of Richard Serra, who's a sculptor which most architects like. <laughs> Um, he does these very monumental, massive pieces of steel. There's a really great exhibition at the moment at the Kugosian in London, if anyone's passing there. Um, but these, I mean, in one sense, they're just massive kind of 10 metres tall slabs of steel. But there's something about the proportion of them that's similar to the proportion of a person, even though on a much bigger scale. And they're also slightly jaunty. They're not all parallel. They're not in a neat line. They kind of step back and forth a bit, and that one's a bit of an angle. I mean, they're very much... There's a kind of analogy between the way they're arranged and, and people. It's not just a massive monolith. There's a kind of attempt to engage on a kind of human level. And those are the sort of things I had in mind thinking about this elevation. Um, it's a brick wall, and I was really determined this end of it was just left as a solid brick wall. There's no windows or anything here, and you really feel the kind of height and mass of it. And then the windows are grouped more towards this end. And the proportions of this are all quite carefully worked out, but this tall end bit here is similar to the proportion of the front door, so hopefully you kind of see those things um, together. It's a kind of both-and strategy. There, there are quite a lot of contradictions. There's, there's contradiction between privacy and openness. I mean, oops. In some ways, you want kind of privacy from the outside world, but equally I wanted this openness, an opportunity for, to engage with people going by. So it's, hopefully it's both private and open at the same time. And equally, you get this tension between the sort of monumentality and the kind of human scale intimacy and the kind of generosity and welcoming as well as being defensive enough to be a house. So I, I like to think that it can do both those things at the same time and, and that those relationships set up a kind of tension in the elevation. Um, on a structural issue, to achieve the bay window at the top, which... Um, <laughs> looks quite effortless. All you see is this timber frame. There's actually a ton of steelwork in there. Um, sometimes to achieve something that looks really simple, you, there's, there's tons of stuff going on behind the scenes, and it's totally over the top in a way when you see this drawing of all the steelwork. But hopefully, I think it kind of makes sense in the effect on the outside. This is a detail of, this, of the projecting bay window. So there's a steel eye section supporting the inner leaf, an, L, an angle supporting the outer leaf, projecting steel supporting the, the frame. There's, there's some insulation in here, but thermally it's a bit of a nightmare. And we would, we would never do anything like this now in our kind of more energy conscious um, days. But this was 15 years ago. Um, and so that's the kind of overall effect. Something else I was quite obsessed with in this idea of offering something to the street was the little space at the front here. Um, in most terrace houses, it's just a junkyard. Someone puts their bins there, there's a few old kebab wrappers or whatever in there. People have net curtains up, there's blank doors, there's no attempt of sort of engagement. So I was really keen that that space at the front can again offer something and um, maybe offer a little bit of, sort of joy or interest to people passing by. So as well as being able to see in, um, we, we planted it. We tried various... Our gardening efforts were pretty basic at this time. I didn't know anything about gardening. We just tried planting all sorts of different things. So one year it was um, lichnus and echinacea and things, and the next year it was a field of poppies, and uh, I think the neighbours genuinely sort of appreciated it. And then internally, it was just bare painted white brickwork, so it's deliberately this quite rough industrial sort of feel, concrete floor. Uh, my wife's interior designer, and I met her in the middle of this, and uh, to her despair. She had to move into this kind of um, quite hard place and uh, so for our next house we very much worked on it together and it's the interiors were thought of in conjunction. Um, and the staircase in a, in a little house takes up disproportionately large amount of space so we tried to make it do as many jobs as possible. Um, so to make the rooms feel big and open and spacious, we crammed all the storage and as much as we could into the staircase. So as it rose up through the house, it, it, it did different things. It was a bike store on the lower floor, and then there were sort of books and CDs all the way up. And right at the top, there was the washing machine and the laundry hung out over the stair. Um, it was a really awkward little bit of plan. All the awkward geometries of the site kind of got pushed into this corner. And... I did quite a lot of the work in this house myself. A builder built the shell and I moved in, but then I did all the finishing off and joinery and stuff myself or with friends. And me and Bob and uh, another friend built the staircase over about nine months of evenings and weekends. And I think a crucial thing with detailing and, and making is you've got to understand who's 
actually going to be doing the work? What skills have they got? What um, budget is there? Um, how able are they to actually do what you want them to do? And we had limited carpentry skills. I mean, I can sort of bang things in and stuff. But um, so all the joints in this were passing joints or just really simply assembled dowel joints. Um, we got a joiner to kind of make a series of pieces. The, the centre was made in sort of seven pieces and all the, that alternate tread stair was made in one piece and then all the other treads were just brought in as single pieces and we had to fit them all together and cut them to fit the shape on site. Um, so that's a bit of it kind of in situ. Um, and the kind of finished thing. But, uh, yeah, but crucially, it was kind of designed around us making it. And then the prize at the end, we had a few spare bits, and if we'd made some, in case we made some mistakes, I mean, somehow we didn't make any big mistakes. And the prize at the end was this dining table, which we made out of the spare Douglas fir for the uprights and a big slab of birch ply and a load of drawers that we found in a skip across the road and uh, clamped them all together. And we had this big dining table. That's only one end of it, but it's got the drawers are in the other end. And I feel these, it's almost got this kind of talismanic property. We left it in the house when we, were, when we sold it. it, was, it I deliberately made it too big so it wouldn't fit out the front door. So hopefully no one's going to be able to remove it. I just feel it's so much a part of that house and the story of the stair and the drawers and everything is it's, it's part of the place. Um, this is a totally different sort of project. Regent's Park Open Air Theatre in the centre of London. Um, 1,200 seat theatre they put on Shakespeare plays. They're kind of signature play, I suppose, is Midsummer Night's Dream. It's all about fairies in the woods and um, people running around in the bushes and dressing up. And, but this was their toilet. Um, Howarth Tompkins um, did a big refurb of this place in, in 2000, but they didn't have the money to do the toilet, so they still look like this, and it rather breaks the spell of the performance if you have to go in there halfway through. Um, this is a winter view, but you can see Howard Tompkins put in all these trellises around here. And it was very much a landscape project. Um, the buildings are hidden behind the hedges. The entrance, this is a, a building for corporate events for the sponsors. There's a little bar in there, and it opens directly out onto the lawn through these doors. You don't actually see that building, it's just a shed. Um, and the toilets, similarly, were sort of hidden in the bushes. And the whole place is like that. And in the summer, all this is alive, and there are little lights twinkling. Um, it's quite a magical place. So we wanted to kind of redo the toilets in a way that was a, sort of fitted in with the rest of that. Um, one thing I'm obsessed with is landscape. I mean, in a way, landscape is more important or more interesting than the buildings in, to me. And so all our projects have some sort of landscape strategy. I mean, the first house, I think it was more, it was, it was quite little about that little bit of front garden. But in this one, this is probably the most extreme one we've done where we decided the toilets were going to be outside. They didn't really need to be enclosed. So the ladies is just a row of doors here, which opens onto this boardwalk kind of in the park. Um, we treated all, because the buildings are kind of hidden in the hedges, we treated all of them as a series in, of interiors. Um, and this is a little foyer entrance to that um, events building, which is more like a kind of cave, which is literally set into the ground and formed a, an anti-space really before going in there. And it was all about this evening sunlight coming in and the sun does actually shine down there at a certain time of the evening. Um, so it's a really cramped plan just because of the site. And this was, a, this was an ancient plane tree from the original planting of Regent's Park, so that had to be preserved. So we've got a, well, this is, this is the bar rehearsal entrance space to this this foyer, so that's quite a separate thing, this little kind of cave space. Um, this courtyard here is the entrance to the loos, um, and it's got kind of two elevations of, of hedge and then two elevations of building. And we conceived all these things really as interiors, even though some of them don't have roofs on, and some of the walls are made of plants. So you come through the courtyard, and the male loos have got this bit of planting here, so there's a garden there, and then the roof over this bit, so this is half inside, half outside, and the female side is the same, except with a bigger garden. And at the end here, the, the female wash area is like a little kind of boudoir. So this is the entrance to the, the, the events building now. You come down and around and into there and back into the events building behind. But it's, so you come through the hedge into this sort of quite cave-like space, and the sun does actually come down the wall. 
and this is the courtyard entrance to the Louvre. So we've got this little kind of timber porch, and the timber's the interior material. The outside of all the buildings is just clad in green painted cheap timber, which is kind of regions, the Royal Park standard green colour that everything's painted in parks. <clears throat> so it wasn't about the external appearance of these buildings at all. It was really, as I say, a kind of series of interiors. And so you see this courtyard from outside and you just sort of see the glowing porch and the green just disappears into the hedges and, and you're kind of guided inside. And it's all made of timber, um, tri-ply boards and Douglas fir joists. And that's the female washroom with its kind of glossy pink boudoir ceiling and, and lots of views out into the shrubbery. And... This was the planting when after about six months. I, I hadn't been there for a while. I, I hope this has all grown up. It was supposed to have kind of gone up over the trellises and things. And the male one's slightly more enclosed, but similar idea where you're sort of out, in, you're still out in the park. Um, so in about 2008, uh, well, the, the recession kind of started. We were getting on to bigger things. We won a European competition. We were doing big housing estates and stuff and working with some other bigger architects but all that kind of stopped in 2007-8 and but we got approached by a really interesting guy who's a carbon consultant and um, he bought this little terrace house in Hackney it's just a bog standard um, three-story terrace house and he was obsessed with low energy construction and well in his job he was consulting oil companies and things on carbon but he wanted to do a demonstration project um, Crucially, the existing housing stock in this country is, is in a horrendous state, and there are something like 10 million existing homes. Um, so a few of us building nice eco, low-energy houses is not going to solve the environmental issues. And unless we really attack the existing housing stock, we're not really going to make much of a dent on the, the kind of carbon footprint of buildings. Um, a few figures there. Three-quarters of the predicted housing stock of 2050 is already built. We're not going to build a load of new stuff which replaces all this. People, three quarters of people are still going to be living in an old house. Um, households account for over a quarter of the UK's carbon emissions. Um, and there's actually government commitment and a certain amount of policy. And we've got various funding as well for, for other projects um, to kind of take this sort of work further. So there is a government commitment, but it's re since. 2010 or so, it's totally slacked off. The, uh, the greenest government ever in 2010 basically cut all the funding for these things. Um, so this little house, it's just a little terrace house in a row. It's kind of east-west orientation, um, garden elevation, front elevation. It's pretty, pretty straight, flat brick back wall with a couple of little lean-tos. Um, spatially, it's just sort of Two rooms, one front, one back, with a stair going up the side. Um, but it was quite cramped, so our client wanted to... He didn't necessarily want more space, because it was just him and his wife who lived there, but they wanted it better organised. So um, there were two elements to the project. One was to completely insulate and try and push the energy performance of this house as far as we could, um, mainly through as much insulation as we could add, air tightness, and then sort of low energy um, equipment. So in these little houses, adding, I don't know, 200, 300 mil in places to the internal walls of insulation in quite a small room really reduces the size of, of what are already quite compact rooms. So um, we added a, a small extension. So that little sliver at the back, it's only about a metre and a half, two metres, this extension, but it, it just about offsets the amount of space we lost in here. And there's also an extra room up in the attic. So he's not, they're not really getting much extra space. It was quite a leap of um, faith and, and <laughs> principle for this client to do this. It cost a quarter of a million pounds, and he didn't end up with any much more space. But uh, I think he had other reasons for doing it. Um, so this is a brief summary of what we did. So the yellow is the kind of insulation line, the kind of overcoat that goes around the whole house. And it was ridiculously fiddly because our new bit at the back we could build in a sensible new way and get rid of cold bridges. But all this bit at the front, it's a conservation area, so we couldn't do much at the front. So we had to internally insulate these walls. And every single junction was a special situation. I'll come into a few of the details in a sec. But 
So that was the main work of just thermally insulating it and getting airtight junctions. But um, a lot of the low energy people have a, what's called a fabric first approach. I mean, you can, you, can, you can buy some solar panels, you can have a ground source heat pump and all these things. But actually, the crucial thing is to reduce your overall energy demand in the first place. If you don't need the energy, you don't need to generate it. So our principle is always fabric first and trying to get the building working as well as possible. He's actually got a load of PV on the roof um, and rain, rainwater recycling, but those are slight side issues, I think. Um, the main advantage is, so from sort of that line back, that's a new extension. So you get, you get some decent big size rooms, big enough to get a kitchen table in the kitchen and, and a decent living room um, on those two floors and then a new room at the top. So quite a simple plan. Um, this is what we calculated we could do before we started. Um, the blue is the carbon emissions before the job and the pink is afterwards. So you can attack things like the water heating. It, it, it had a gas boiler and there wasn't really an option to do much else. So the water heating didn't really change. And the electrical things, you can make them more efficient. But by far the biggest thing you can do is attack the space heating demand. And that's what the insulation's about and the air tightness. So <laughs> trying, to, trying to keep the energy you've got, trying to heat inside the house. And we reckon that we could achieve, what's that for? It's about a 90% reduction in the energy requirement. Um, we ended up demolishing most of the inside of the house and just retaining the facade. Another ridiculous anomaly, an anomaly with the British system is the VAT. You pay on a, on a refurb, you pay 20% VAT on everything. If you demolish and start again, you pay zero. So <laughs> the client worked out that it was cheaper to demolish all the stuff inside and rebuild it than it was to pay the 20% VAT on trying to fiddle around it. And also meant we could deal with a lot of the thermal bridges and things more easily. So carbon-wise, it's a slightly negative thing to do. Um, but it then allowed him to spend more money on his insulation, I guess. So inside, we ended up with a pretty blank shell, which meant that we could kind of address all the kind of thermal bridges. So at the front, all the timber joists used to just run into the front wall, but we put in these steels across the front and took all the joists out the walls. They were all kind of rotten anyway, built into kind of wet brickwork effectively. And it meant we could get a gap between the, the floors and the wall, which meant you can have continuous insulation up the inside of the house. Um, and at the back in the new bit, this is, I mean, there are endless details I could talk about, but this is a typical situation in the new bit at the back. We, we were forced to have these sort of steps in the elevation by the conservation officers. They wouldn't let us just build a flat two-story extension. We had to kind of make it look like it was stepping back. So it just ended up a lot more complicated than it could have been. But to deal with the, that sort of step, that's a possible thermal bridge taking the weight of that brickwork down. But you can buy, this is foam glass insulation, which is really, has really high compressive strength. So we, by putting a couple of blocks in that, in that area, you can kind of eliminate that cold bridge. And there it is being built into the bottom of the wall. Um, the window detail, it's a cavity wall with, I think it had 200 mil of insulation and these boron wall ties, which are, again, are very low conductivity, better than stainless steel or galvanized. Um, crucially, air tightness, you have, to, you have to have, on any sort of low energy passive house level building, you have to have an air tightness layer, which usually runs around the inside. You can do it on the outside in, in new construction. But generally, it kind of runs around a plaster zone um, and round into the window and around there. And at the junctions between materials, you have to use a series of tapes um, so all these junctions here between, say, this plywood box and the plaster are taped, between the box and the window are taped. Um, that image on the... Oh, no, that's, that's the plywood box. Yeah, so to, to actually give yourself something to tape to, we came up with this detail of a plywood box, which is actually what quite a lot of people use doing these sorts of projects. So you build a, you build a kind of plywood box which the window then sits into, and you can then tape onto that with other materials. Uh, it's just some details of the floor joists and the beam. And then the front wall on the existing, against the existing brickwork, um, instead of just building timber stud work, we found these insulated studs, which are a dense form of insulation um, with a, a bit of OSB on the back. And it means that you could 
you could have battens and counter battens, but with very high levels of insulation, which you then fill in between with insulation and with a cavity outside to allow ventilation and condensation to evaporate. So each one of these details, we hadn't done this stuff before, we were kind of researching and working these things out as we went along. And, and actually there are a number of officers who are doing similar things in parallel. Um, Bob's um, now wife, Marion, has just uh, produced a book for the IRBA on retrofit projects, Marion Bailey, um, with 20 examples. This is in it and another one of our projects. Um, but that's full of these sorts of details if you're interested in that. Um, and at the front, because it was a conservation area, we couldn't do anything to these windows looks-wise, but we managed to persuade the conservation officer to let us put in these very thin double-glazed units into the existing astragals, and they just about fitted without having to kind of replace the windows. But we did take all the windows out and sort of insulate behind them and try and kind of eliminate all the gaps. Because you've made it airtight, you need some air to breathe. So all these low-energy houses have a mechanical ventilation system. Um, it's known as MVHR, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. Um, so you have a box somewhere in the house which sucks air in from outside, delivers it to the habitable rooms, and an extract duct which sucks it out of the wet rooms, bathroom, utility, kitchen, and, but and then spits that air out. But crucially, there's a heat exchanger, and generally they're about 90% efficient. So if your air outside is zero and the air inside is 20 degrees, um, the heat exchanger will raise the temperature of that zero degree air up to probably about 18 and, and then supply it into the house. So you're reusing the heat that's in the house. You're not chucking all your heat out the window. And this, this is the thing that most people have the biggest trouble getting to grips with, with low energy housing. I don't want to live in an air conditioned house and why can't I just open the window? It seems really counterintuitive that you need this bit of kit, but I'm totally converted to it, I and mean, I've got one in my house, and the air quality is just fantastic. It makes, it's really even, it's always warm. You don't have, and it keeps, the, the, other, the other good thing about it is it keeps the relative humidity very even, say between 40 and 60%, which is good for things like um, stopping dust mites or asthma, it's supposed to be. There's some, there's some studies which suggest it's good for uh, preventing respiratory diseases and mold growth and all that sort of thing. So that... That's the MBHR unit, and, and it just sort of lives in a cupboard somewhere. Um, and it just has this ductwork which goes off around the house. So you very much have to think about it at the start of the project. Where's this ductwork going to go? I mean, it goes in ducts kind of this big. It's quite, and it goes, goes to every single room. So if you don't want it to look like that by the time you've finished, <laughs> I'm pointing at a huge duct at the back. <laughs> you have to kind of think it through right from the outset. And then a man comes along with a fan and tests to see how well you've done. Um, to get to Passive House, you need to have 0.6 air changes per hour. Building regs demands 10 air changes per hour, so it's quite a leap from building regs. Uh, on this house, we achieve 1.2 um, air changes per hour, which is pretty good for a, our first ever attempt. Um, there's, a, there's a standard called Enerfit, which is the kind of Passive House Trust's um, refurb level. It's slightly easier than Passive House, taking into account the fact that you're refurbishing an existing building. We've since achieved kind of one on most of our refurbishment projects, but it just involves endless checking, going around every window, all these joints, bits of tape everywhere, just endlessly feeling for more leaks, and it's persistence is the only way to get, do better at it. Um, so this is our final calculation of how much, we reckon it cost a certain amount of carbon to do the work, 26 and a half tonnes of carbon, and in terms of the saving that that was going to produce and how the house performed, it had a payback period of about almost six years in carbon terms. So even though we demolished most of the house, rebuilt it all, that carbon was, was paid off in six years. And from that point on, it's, it's, a, it's a net saving. And that's just my drawing trying to show just every single detail is different. Every single detail is fiddly. Need, you only go, like in a, in a big building, an office building, you can go, you have a wall that's, I don't know, 20 metres long before you get to an awkward bit. Whereas this, you've gone about that far and you get to another awkward bit and another awkward bit. And, and that's just in plan. It's the same in section and it's, it's, it's fiddly work. Um, that's the back of it rebuilt. And inside, crucially, there's nothing really to notice that all that stuff's there. That, the only thing you can see is just on the wall up in the corner, that little white thing is the air supply from the ductwork but all the ductwork's integrated into all the wall recesses and chimney breasts and things. 
We managed to squeeze in a few nice details as well. And a lot of the timber and stuff got reused, partly given away to neighbours and things, but also just on the site, you built this shed in the garden out of loads of joists and bits of old uh, windows and things. Um, so this is what we calculated, that we could get the total carbon emissions down from up here to there, which is about a... That's, that's about 25% of that. But we put in a lot of monitoring, and we found, actually, it was performing rather better than we thought. Um, we were getting... So figures of sort of 1,200 instead of 2,000. So actually, the overall reduction in carbon emissions is about 80% for this house. Um, whereas the heat demand, so space heating cost, we've reduced something 91%, I think it is. And the benefit level is shown there that you have to achieve to get benefit and passive house slightly lower. We've since done this on a number of properties. This is the biggest one we've done, which is a grade two listed house in Bloomsbury, which we just finished this last year. Um, typical Bloomsbury, um, Bath, Clifton sort of house. Um, I'm not going to talk through this, but on this one we achieved a similar sort of 90% reduction in the space heating demand and a 77% reduction in the overall energy demand. Um, oops. Not sure what that's doing there. So the window detail for this, this is, this is not only a conservation area, but it's listed. So we weren't allowed to touch the old Georgian sash windows at all. They kind of said, nope, no secondary glazing, nothing. We don't care. You've, you can have the rest of it passive house, but you've got to have single glazing, rattly old Georgian windows. Um, but we finally persuaded the conservation officer to let us put secondary glazing in. And so we actually took apart, we took all the windows out, took all the old listed sash boxes, everything out, and put in insulation behind it all and then put it all back in again and put secondary glazing in, just sort of sneaked it in behind the sash box and, and the um, jo original Georgian shutters. And that meant we were able to kind of sort out all the leaks, tidy all this up. And again, we got to one, I think just over one air changes per hour on this house, even though it still had its old Georgian single glazed windows in. And that's one of the windows back in place. Again, Architecturally, if you, want, if you want kind of glamour photos, this isn't the world for you. It's kind of, the result was that this looks like it did before we started. <laughs> Oops. Sorry, my photos are out of order. <clears throat> so, um, so I moved down to Somerset about five years ago, and um, my wife was really keen to move. I wasn't too bothered, but the deal was that we got to build another house. And um, we'd been talking about it for years, all the time we were in our other house. Um, so we had quite strong ideas, and we wanted to build two criteria, really. We wanted to live in the landscape. We wanted to build a house which totally fitted in its place and was kind of, I don't know, integrated with the landscape. And also it had to be a very low energy house, and passive house was the obvious target. So the house we built is a certified passive house. Um, this is a kind of, it's actually about there, at the bottom of this hill. That's an old Iron Age hill fort, just near Glass Glastonbury Tours, just over the other side of that hill. So it's where the Somerset levels kind of come in and meet the kind of lumpy hills like Glastonbury. Um, it's just at the edge of a village. So there's the hill fort behind, steep hill behind. The village kind of goes off around here, and then there's a field, and then there's us just there. So we've got, got best of both worlds, where we're just surrounded by fields, but um, the village is nearby. And um, there was a little bungalow on the site before, uh, which meant that we, it was a dead cert we'd get planning permission for something. The, the question was just how big and how ugly we could make it. Um, you can see the kind of levels beyond, and there's a floodplain, there's a river, which is quite boggy there. We haven't had bad floods, but it does flood. Um, but this is what sold it to us, this amazing view. And it had perfect aspect for a passive house. That's, that's south west slightly off south so it's pretty much south orientation orientation is critical because you need you, you get your heat from the sun and if you can't have your main windows facing south then it's quite difficult to do um, so we started looking at schemes and, and, and there was a planning issue as well we couldn't be too much higher than the original house which was just a bungalow so we built a two-story house which is only about half a metre taller than the original bungalow. And we did that by digging it down into the ground. You see on this bottom sketch, it's kind of single storey on the roadside and two storey on the other side, sort of built into the hill. And um, just by having a very shallow pitch on the roof, it's only about 10 degrees. Um, 
This is the north side, which is just the porch, kind of log piles, not many windows, and all the windows around the southeast and southwest sides. Um, it was very much about the view and this connection to landscape, and you could just build a massive glass wall type house and it'd just all be about this view. Ta-da! The entire time, everywhere you went, you'd just get this view. But I felt it was more interesting to have more controlled views because it's quite a subtle landscape, the levels. It's, it's just quite flat and there's barns and stuff, and that's about it. But actually, by framing these views, by picking out certain directions, you, you pick out different things in the landscape and actually gives each room quite a different character. So the main, the main dining kitchen room looks out over that photo you just saw now of the barn. But over to one side of my office, for instance, there's a big walnut tree kind of across the field. And there are often sheep in the field peering through our bedroom window. And, and then the windows on the west side look out over an orchard and, uh, sorry, the southeast side look out over an orchard and sort of into our garden. So that was the kind of concept of how the windows would work. And we spent a lot of time drawing these sort of sketches, sort of interior sketches about relationships between spaces. Um, we'd been drawing these things before we even found this site, just thinking about how we wanted our house to be. And I think that was quite an important part of the design process because it's, it allows you to formulate an idea about how you want to live. Um, it's not just about what it looks like in the context and things. It's also a, a choice about how you want to live. Um, this is actually pretty much what we built with a sort of deck, a veranda out the front and our dining table and the kitchen through into the hallway beyond. Um, <clears throat> this is the main bedroom with a kind of ensuite bathroom with glass, which is again, not far off what we built and a little loo behind the door. Um, we wanted to build a timber house as well because it was, I was quite obsessed with timber building ever since we were in London and we hadn't really got to do much. Um, so it's, a t it's clad all in green oak on the outside, but inside we didn't want it to turn into a plasterboard house. So the internal rooms are all lined with timber. The nicer rooms, like our bedroom and the main reception rooms, are lined with oak floorboards, the same as the floor. And the other rooms are lined with painted ply. Um, and drawings like this, kind of looking out from the house and how it related to the garden. Um, this is our kind of lower veranda, which kind of goes out onto a bit of lawn. It's not quite like this in the end. The steps aren't like that. But it, it, it just sets out a kind of agenda for the sort of feel we wanted it to have. Um, this is what we, after a few months, we'd come to this sort of thing. Um, big, low, overhanging eaves. Single story that side, two story that side. Pushed up into that corner of the site so we get the most of the south-facing garden. Um, we put this in for planning just to see what would happen because it's, it's something like 230% bigger than the original house, so, which is quite risky planning-wise. But they gave us permission straight away. So actually, then you had to think, right, what's <laughs> how we, like with the previous house in a way, right now, what do I actually want to do? Um, and I wasn't really happy with this. It's, this is pretty much what we've ended up with. But um, for passive house, you, you're very reliant on solar gain. So on, on this side, on these two sides, there are a lot of windows. Um, but the problem with that is overheating in the summer. So shading is a crucial part of passive house design. So we had these big overhanging eaves, which um, shade, the, shade you from the high summer sun, but they let in, the, kind of judged how far out they should come just by a bit of analysis. So they still let the winter, <coughs> sorry, lower winter sun in. Um, but I wasn't, yeah, so I wasn't very happy with this and there was something kind of missing from it. And, as we came down here more and started to kind of look around the surrounding buildings, we started looking at all the surrounding barns. And I, I, I really like these kind of 20th century, quite humdrum vernacular barns. Um, this, this, this is a view from our top terrace. We look straight at this barn. So it's, it was very influential on the, the house. And it's got this really simple steel structure, just kind of cement fiber or asbestos roof and a bit of tin around the outside. And the hay bales come and go. It has this quite dynamic quality and the sheep shelter in there in the summer from the sun. But the other side, if it's closed, it's just got simple kind of metal cladding on it. Um, so it's quite a complex building, even though it's very simple. And it's just, it's very honest. It's very, what you see is what you get. And that's always a kind of attractive quality in architecture. Um, and again, some other kind of barns. This one's got a low pitched roof similarly. So we came round to, and also I, well, I've worked abroad quite a bit, and I, I really like these colonial houses. This one's in Argentina, but I'd seen them in all, all sorts of places of, with verandas wrapping around, giving you this kind of 
outdoor space that, you could, that extends the season when you can live outside. And similarly in the Alps, you get these amazing overhanging roofs where the amount of stuff going on in here, there's a place to hang up washing, you store your firewood, there's a table to eat outside. You can, it just gives you a lot of versatility and flexibility in the, the way the house can be used. So we added these posts to it, <laughs> which forms a veranda around the southeast and southwest side. Um, this is a sort of abstracted plan of it. So it's got these solid walls on the northeast and northwest, and on this side it's much more open. But crucially, the posts kind of extend out beyond the, the envelope of the house, defining a kind of carport and a porch and the verandas. So it, it kind of binds the house into the landscape somehow. And we thought quite a lot about how the landscape comes up and meets the house. It kind of dissolves from kind of wilds, raised beds to this kind of more neat lawn and some brick pavers and there's all, these thresholds were all quite carefully considered. Um, I'll zip through some of these. So this is the kind of energy diagram. As I say the verandas you get the passive solar gain. Um, you can open the windows cross ventilation in the summer we have the windows open all the time. Um, the mechanical ventilation unit the only heating we've got in here is a wood-burning boiler stove, which is for heating the, wind, the water in the winter. And we've got a solar panel on the roof that heats the water in the summer. So, and a big, oops, yeah, there, and a big storage tank for hot water down in the basement. Um, so that's the only kit in there, really. Um, we haven't got any space heating. Um, so constructionally, it's a, it's a big kind of concrete slab and retaining wall cast into the ground, and all that is sitting on 300 mil of polystyrene underneath that. So the whole, all that concrete's inside the thermal envelope, which again helps with the kind of regulation of uh, um, temperature. And it's, a, it's just a timber frame, panel timber frame built up on top of the slab. And you see the timber frames split into two. There's actually two, there's an inner frame and an outer frame, and the outer frame is held off the inner frame on a series of plywood gusset plates. Um, again, in Passive House, eliminating cold bridges is critical. So the concrete only engages with the inner frame and the outer frame kind of hangs outside and all that is then filled with insulation and the windows have got this board lining around them. So all that gets filled with insulation and you, you minimize the amount of cold bridging. Well, it gets quite complicated around the windows, but you can see the kind of the two frames and the plywood plates holding them apart. And then inside, the whole lot gets taped up with all these tapes, which is a really fiddly process. I literally hired a fan and spent three weeks in there just groveling around, feeling for leaks everywhere. And then the whole lot's pumped with warm cell insulation, which is recycled newspapers. Um, we haven't got any foam insulations or uh, kind of chemical products really in here, or very few. Uh, which was again a, a kind of choice about atmosphere and um, kind of pollution issues. There's a window detail where the, the window kind of sits on the bridge between the inner and outer frame and the, the green bits are the tapes which you tape between the different bits of OSB linings and between the windows. Um, that's a corner of the timber frame so you can see that even on a corner there's no lump of stud work or anything you just get continuous insulation. Uh, I'll skip through some of these. The air that's a typical bit of air tightness taping. Discovered when I started taping it that the person putting the battens on had put them on in the wrong place to start with, pulled them all off but not filled the holes. So this is typical. There's just thousands of bits of tape all over that house. And the man with the blower. Yeah, so then, uh, so there it is, sort of in the landscape. So we've got these, all these spaces hopefully have this very direct relationship out to the landscape. And... I like to think that it sits quite well in its place and feels, uh, even though it's influenced by a lot of crazy different colonial <laughs> foreign alpine things, it, it feels of its place in that landscape. That's it.